Hello, my name is Megan O'Daniel and I am one of the health sciences instructors at EC3. I teach pharmacy, phlebotomy, and EKG technician. All those are certification pathways through a national exam. And for a couple years now, I've been working on a capstone project. There's been a huge push in project-based learning throughout the nation, and more schools are going toward that type of learning. So two years ago in um, 2020, I began these projects in a dream that we could present these to the district and kind of have like a fair, but then COVID hit and we were not allowed to do this kind of setup. So things have been kind of rocky getting to this point, but so far I think I've um, been very proud of what the students have accomplished and the fact that we were able to do this this year. And these capstone projects are t very well turned out. They um, are a nice review right before they take their exam because reviewing all that material just is not particularly fun. But this is a way that they can be creative and hopefully things that they forgotten at the beginning of the trimester now has finally sunk in. Hi, I'm Carly Price. I'm a senior in the Pharmacy Tech Pathway at EC3. Hi, I'm Emily Mom. I'm a senior in the Pharmacy Tech Pathway EC3. First of all, the main points we have is history pharmacy, inpatient and community pharmacy, and modern and laws. Modern pharmacy and pharmacy laws. History of pharmacy is more or less like concoctions or other medication they have made like before, like in the past six like centuries ago, such as like we used to use tiger fat for joint pain and wine and peppers are such as uh, stomach problems and we also used uh, garlic for inflammation and trephining is a type of like procedure they used to do such as like where they cut a hole in the back of your head and they used to think evil spirits was living or was the cause of your sickness so they would cut a hole and to get the sickness out. Responsibilities is such as like inpatient and community pharmacy. Inpatient is more of us of like in a hospital setting you're going to be like in a basement and work so you're not really getting so much social so it's better for people who are not social. Community pharmacy is such as like Kroger's where you're going to be dealing with a lot of people so you're going to have to have good people skills such as like being nice to people and always sitting there and explaining to people what their medications are and how it could interact with other medications. So another big thing is modern pharmacy and then it says an ever-changing profession because with more technology and more medications, things change every day, the laws change. Because now, like obviously, back when like people first started using medications, they didn't have you know, robots to count out their pills for them or an electronic prescription. And then, also there's a lot of different things with the laws, there's a lot of rules when it comes to controlled substances, and a big thing that made the Board of Pharmacy like start making so many different laws was the opioid uh, crisis, because so many people were overdosing and getting addicted to opioids that they started like classifying medications to make it to where you can only get it a certain amount of time before your refill is up. And also the Board of Pharmacy like differs in every state and it like each one caters to the needs of their own states and there's different rules for each state. So like say if you could be certified in Kentucky but you could move to California and completely like not be a certified pharmacy technician anymore. Okay, um, introduce yourselves. Right, my name is Juliana. My name's Hannah. My name's Riley. I'm Monica. 
Okay, um, so what is your project about? Can you tell me about that? Um, so we're in phlebotomy, and we... Oh. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, when you break a phlebotomy, it means like cutting into the vein. So I did the history of it. Phlebotomy started as bloodletting, and they would just cut into your vein and let all the bad stuff drain out. But now they do it in a more sterile way, and um, they'll test the blood. And then I covered legal concerns, and we want to make sure that we follow all the legal concerns, that way we don't end up in legal trouble. Like informed consent is a huge one, you want to make sure that you have the consent of your patient, and you want to make sure that they know what they're getting into, like what you're going to do, um, the risks of the con or anything that can happen, and that's like, yeah. And then um, you want to make sure you follow HIPAA, which is the privacy laws, making sure that you don't like expose patient information or talk about them in public or anything like that. And then, Riley? <laughs> I did the emergency procedures. Um, I think it's one of the most important ones to learn phlebotomy because you have to know what to do just in case anything goes wrong. Um, basically, it talks about the complications of what can happen during a venipuncture. And one of the most common ones is a hematoma, which is what this looks like. It's very painful but very common in blood drawing. Basically it talks about the causes of hematomas and how to treat them when it does happen and how to prevent them. Another one is petechiae, which is also very common. This is caused by a too tight of a tourniquet and many other things. Uh, I think the emergency procedure is one of the most important things to learn because you have to know what to do just in case anything bad happens. Monica? Okay, uh, I did... Um, so whenever you think of like phlebotomy, you would think of like blood, sticking, so on and so forth. So this is kind of just shows everything that you can test out in your body that's not really blood or sticking related. Like you can do a urine sample and figure out all we're done here shows all the urine you can do. And you also can do feces to see if there's like blood in your feces and other cool things that not everyone would think you would learn in that class. Oh, okay, so when you think of phlebotomy, you think of like blood sticking like always. But uh, this area kind of just shows the type of like things that don't really involve blood or sticking. Like you can do a urine sample. And then down here kind of just shows the different types of urine you can do to test out. And then you can also do feces. You can test your feces. So, um, yeah, I just think it's a cool thing to know that it's not just blood and sticking. And... All right, so what did you guys do for this here? These are, these are 3D models. They're kind of like a blown up version of tubes once they've been through a centrifuge, which is a machine that spins the tubes around and basically mixes the additives in and separates them. So we have a serum tube and it has serum and a, a blood clot. And then that one is a plasma tube and it has the blood plasma and then a buffy coat, which is platelets and white blood cells and then red blood cells. And basically you would take any, um, you could test any form of that specimen for depending on what kind of tests you do. And then we also have the pictures up here, and those are just like things that a phlebotomist would see or use on a day-to-day -day basis. And we have these little cards that um, people can pull out and read, and they have the like, corresponding information about the pictures. Cool. So tell us a fun fact. Do you have a fun fact? Yes. Um, is the one that he basically founded most of the Medicare groups, yeah. Yeah. including Pharmacy or one of them. And he also was one of the first I, people I to associate good hygiene with good health. And he also founded the Blue Cuties, which is blood, uh, yellow bile, black bile, and they equal air, water, fire, and fire. Awesome. Thank you for doing this. Looks good. Good job. Hello there. And uh, can I get each and every one of you guys' names? Hi, I'm Elena. My name's Kalina. My name's Julie. My name's Chloe. We're the Health Science Pathway. All right. And so what type of project are you guys working on? Or at least what did you work on? Our project's for EKG, which stands for electrocardiogram. And it measures the rhythm of your heart like shows how your heart's um, beating so what if your guys heart so what if your heart was beating too fast that would be called tachycardia Here. which means uh, it's like up to 200 beats per minute oh okay so is that would that be a good thing or a bad thing well actually no it depends on what type of tachy tachycardia because 
Sinus tachycardia is just a normal rhythm, but it's very fast. But there's other things like VTAC, which is fatal. Oh. Okay, but okay, but what if your heart was beating too slow too as well? That's bradycardia, and it's under 100 beats per minute, or under 60. My bad. And so that would also be fatal. Yes. Okay. I I really love what you guys do over here, huh? So what does this mean right here? What does all this mean right here? That is a like model of an EKG where you would place the leads and the electrodes to actually uh, record the EKG. Hmm. Okay, okay. So uh, can you read me one? Can one of you guys read me one of these so I can understand a little bit more? Accreditation and certification. Uh, that's what we have to do at the end of the course. We have to have at least an uh, exam average of 78 to take the test, and it's what allows us to work in hospitals ah. if we pass it. Okay, career pass, all right. Hmm. Um, the 12 lead EKG it consists of 10 electrodes that work together to get 12 different views of the heart. So that's what the EKG actually is. These are an example of the electrodes that are used, and then this is an example of an EKG. Wow. Okay, okay. All right, well, I, I, that's kind of all I have for you. Thank you. You're welcome. Your names? Uh, Mackenzie Miller. Jackson Abel. Reagan Donovan. Rachel Tanner. Um, so, what is a pharmacy? Oh, good question. Um, well, Pharmacy, it's a two trimester course. Um, pharmacy is a lot, really. It's a lot of information. This right here is just a fraction of what we learn. This is only, um, this is really only just the pharma, like the history learned about pharmacy. We learn a lot more about pharmacy, including med math, because it's it's two trimester course that's thrown into one. So that's that's about much about the class. Um, but like deep. pretty much what a pharmacy is is a place that is on very high lockdown just because of all the medication that's in there and it is a place where medication is dispensed to patients who need it and at the right dosage at the right time with the right medication. Uh, there's different kinds of pharmacies. There's community and institutional pharmacies. So community you're dealing like hands-on with that patient while well, institutional you're like in a hospital setting and your customers are nurses because they are the ones who administrate the medication. Um, how has the pharmacies and medication, I guess, changed over time. Okay, um, so like in ancient pharmacy, they would use like more of like herbal mixtures and just like stuff that they thought would heal like your wound. Like they would put, right here it says, they would put juice from a succulent leaf onto the wound that they thought would um, heal it. And But now, since medication has like advanced and evolved and stuff, we now have like, we now no ways to be able to put that kind of stuff into people's bodies and in controlled manners and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. so why are there so many laws with pharmacies? Well, this our poster only has like about about ten laws, but there's actually like fifty laws, and there are so many because medication is a very controversial thing to deal with because of how you can overdose, how you can like not take enough, how it affects your body. And so they have to very strictly mandate it so that um, it's not misused. And it's safe. It's safe for everyone to use and you don't give them, because you can, you know, you can mess up and give someone too much and that could kill a patient. And so you don't want that. That's why they're, that's why there's so many and that's why they're so strict. So. Safety administration is probably the biggest thing that you have to watch out for because one extra pill could cost somebody their life. So the amount of times you count medication, the amount of times you check the dosage that that pill bottle has before you put it in the prescription bottle is like all the biggest thing. So what are the different types of pharmacies? There's the community pharmacy, which is like your local like Walgreens and just CVS, like stuff like that. There's like an institutional pharmacy, which is like in a hospital where like they would give you medication if you're admitted to the hospital or stuff like that. And there's also um, telepharmacy. Um, 
you can do telepharmacy. You call and it gives your stuff to the mail. There's mail pharmacy. Um, nursing homes use the mail stuff, mail orders. They come in bulk. Um, I worked at a nursing home for a little bit. We would have pharmacy vans come by and they would deliver these huge just med packs of pills for the patients. And so there's all kinds of different like ways for pharmacy. I'm trying to think how many there is. I can't think of the top of my head, but there's quite a few five to or six. Yeah, five or six to, to get around and get everybody so make sure everyone has what they need. So yeah. So what are these, I guess? This is your pill counter and you would use it like pour your supply into there. Use this right here, this piece, to um, pop up when there would be a film here that would keep it closed, and you would use that to pop it open. After that, um, um, we, we've we learned to count in fives. You can count in however which way makes it easier for you, but you would get a, a script, a prescription, and then you would do what the doctor says. You would figure out the math and how many pills are needed for that prescription. And so we count in fives here. So we go five, five. So we're going to count out 15 here. So you get your 15. Um, you take your excess that you don't need, you dump it back into the supply. the supply, and then you would take your prescription bottle, prescription bottle dump it in there. Uh, yeah, you would recount it after that, and then you would label it, and then you would send it off to the patient for their needs. And prescriptions go through multiple stages. So the doctor, if you're doing like e-scribing, it goes from a doctor's office to the pharmacy, and it is typed from the prescription and then that prescription is sent to the pharmacist to check and make sure it's typed correctly. And then from there, it's sent to the printer, it's printed, and then the pa papers with the prescriptions on them are sent to the fillers, the fillers fill them. Once it's filled, it goes back to the pharmacist, they check it, and once it's checked, it's ready to be sold. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Can you guys introduce yourselves? Hi, I'm Rachel Tanner. Hey, I'm Maddie Barba. I'm Emily Culver. I'm Lillian Sanders. Okay. Can you tell me a little bit about your project? Uh, okay, so this is our phlebotomy project. Um, on it, you can see where we've gone in detail about um, the history of phlebotomy and like how modern phlebotomy is right now. Um, we also have like the methods of phlebotomy. So um, in our class, we learn a lot about venipunctures and how to take blood, which is phlebotomy. We also learn the different types of how to take blood and the test that you would use for the blood that you draw. Um, we also talk about the laws and in phlebotomy in any healthcare setting, laws are really important because there is a lot of risks in healthcare. So you really want to know what laws you have to follow and what laws are important to your um, career and your job. Um, we also talk about patient care and um, complications and emergency procedures because in any healthcare setting there is a really good chance of risk in hurting your patient obviously which you don't want to do but there's always a chance of it and so we learn how to deal with that and what steps we need to take to correct the matter. You can pass it and then if you would talk about them. Okay. Okay, so these are our 3D models. So this is just like a tube of blood that like hasn't been separated or anything. And then this is a tube of blood that's been centrifuged into the whole blood, the serum, and the plasma. So this is our little centrifuge. <laughs> and what goes in it is just like the tube with the blood and then the additives on the bottom. <laughs> and then it would spin really, really fast. And what would come out is the separated blood with the serum, the plasma, and the whole blood. Thank you. Is that it? Or is there... Okay, thank you. This is a model of the exterior heart because we had to pick between like five different categories. Um, so we had to use five different materials. So we ended up using this kind of felt um, and these weird materials. And then she let us use the stuffing as <laughs> another material. Um, these, we also had to have interactives. So we have little curtains. Cute. And they're kind of, you can also just flip them up if it's too much to push them to the side. <laughs> um, and then this, we actually thought we could put leads, like actual leads and stuff, and let people take them off and That's place them so cool. where, they where, they where they go. Just in case nobody listens or can nobody read. Knows? Yeah. Because, yeah. like, there's. Oh. 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 All right, see? I didn't listen. I'll read. <laughs> I want to throw up your poster. 
No, it's fine. We su we, we super glued and hot glued all these on. Oh. Um, but no, so we let we can let everybody, and then it looks like you're hooked up after they're all said and done. It looks like you're hooked up to the little EKG machine. That's okay. awesome. Yep. Very good. Thank you. So, are you gonna get your certification and work at the hospital? Um, my parents work at the hospital already. My dad's Kevin Nickerson, and so, my step. I love Kevin. My stepmom is Bethany Nickerson. So. Yeah. So I was. They're hoping to help me get a job yes. there one day. Um, <laughs> it's funny that you know my dad. <laughs> yeah. 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 Are you nervous? No. Don't be nervous. Yes. This looks great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, can you guys introduce yourselves? I am Samantha Ragsdale. I'm Chelsea Menace. Tinley Puckett. All right, so tell me a little bit about your guys' project. So our project is about what we have learned over the course of our EKG technician uh, trimester. Uh, we actually, this is all the information we need to know to take the NH NHA exam, which it gets our certification in EKGs. Um, can you tell me a little about, about your model and your um, project there? Yes. So actually we have, on our, underneath our curtains on this one, we have the history of AKG, EKGs. So this one over here is about like what happened in the old times about it. And then the one over there is about modern the modern today's time. And then we have how our EKG is actually set up. Um, she actually explains that, so we're gonna switch really quick. <laughs> so with V1 and V2, you have V1 on the right side of your chest and V2 is on the left. Um, you're gonna skip V3 for right now. You're gonna go to V4, which is your fifth intercostal space. And how we determine that is actually through your ribs. Um, you're going to go back up to V3 and place that between V2 and V4. Um, V5 is your anterior axillary line. And V6 is your mid-axillary line. And then whenever you get to your limb leads, you're going to place your electrodes on your wrist right here and then in between your legs down at the bottom. So Sorry, I'm so sorry. Okay. Anyways, so this is our model. Our model is showing what we read as EKG text, how to explain what it is. These are actually interactive, so we actually have them off when someone comes over here and looks, and we put them back on. They, We have them put them on where they think they go. They are color-coded. Um, the P wave is an electrical depolarization of the atrial of the heart. Guys, showing with the string is showing how the string is constricted so that's what happens to your heart your heart is actually contracting in the P wave the QRS is the impulses spreading through the ventricles as the QRS complex and then the repolarization of the ventricles is the T wave which when she releases the string it shows the heart is relaxing um, typically, we do EKGs for when people have heart attacks, so we are reading where in the heart is happening so we know how to fix it, so how, what treatment they need, if they need stents or if they need an agnoplasty, I can't say that one, can you say it, the anoplastia, pretty much we take a ventricle of the heart and it's um, burned away so like it's no longer working so they don't have a cardiac disorder um, they might have a heart bypass surgery or a valve disease treatment or a pacemaker placed in their chest all right can you guys introduce your guys yourselves uh, I'm Chloe Frederick I'm Grace Maravella I'm Kaviana Ramirez. Can you guys tell us a little bit about your guys' poster? Yes. So, starting off, the, we had a pharmacy, cl pharmacy class here at EC3, and we all had to do posters. So, this is just an overview of it. And over here, we have modern phlebotomy. It's basically job skills, professionalism, 
basically what to expect if you wanted to become a pharmacist. And there's also some agencies associated with it, like the Joint Commission, some certifications that you would need. And then over here are some laws, like there's the Pure Food, Pure Food and Drug Act. It like monitors all the medications and stuff like that. And then down here is the different type of pharmacy settings, like outpatient and just the differences between those. And then over here is history of phlebotomy. So it goes deeper into it so you have a better understanding of it. And that's basically everything. Sweet. Nice job, guys. Uh, please tell me your names. Reagan Wells. Isabella Riggs. Kaviana Ramirez. Juliana Kider. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about your project? Yeah. So we did phlebotomy, as you can see, and then we just have different aspects of phlebotomy. Over here we have the history and some facts and what phlebotomy is, which is the act of drawing blood either from a decision or a cut. And then over here is agencies associated with phlebotomy, um, some skills, um, the professionalism that comes with the job, and what you need to do to become a phlebotomist. Over here is some complications, like what can go wrong and what they are. So everything is planned. And then over here is like chain of custody, HIPAA, which um, protects patient information. Form consent, just legal issues with phlebotomy. And then this is our 3D model. We just did a hand show showcasing the veins. Okay. And under these flaps that you see over here, we have some hidden facts. They're just interesting facts. And we also have this 3D model which showcases the order of draw. And people who couldn't come up are allowed to replicate it onto this. So what are some complications of drawing blood? Um, some complications are hematomas, hemolysis. So hematomas is when you stick and there is basically a bad bruise when the blood gets out and it's surrounding the vein. Um, so you can have nausea, people faint typically, and then you just have to lay them on their back. So stuff like that. So. Can you tell me a little bit about the order of draw and just what kind of goes with that? So the order of draw, it's shown here again, but we have it, it's based on what test you need and that's why we have it. So do you want to explain that a little bit? So like um, different tubes uh, go with different tests, so uh, you some tests you kind of draw blood differently. So say one tube um, say you have a glucose test, which is the gray tube, which is the last one you would draw. So if you had different tests before that, you would draw those before the glucose. Why does it matter so much to have a certain order? Um, different tubes have different um, additives. So like in the tube, it had anticoagulants or co coagulants. So they'll react with the blood differently. So you kind of want to draw certain ones before others. What are some of the, I guess, hidden facts on your presentation? For that one up here, if you do it, it says like the first president's death was due to a bad um, bloodletting procedure, which is phlebotomy. It used to be called bloodletting, so that's up there. Um, this one, it just reads, um, the total length of your veins and capillaries combined equals to about 60,000 miles. So just stuff like that. Um, thank you guys for <laughs> uh, participating. Thank you. Hi, I'm Katie Skaggs. I'm a nurse educator at Baptist Health Harden. I have been there for 11 years. Hi, I'm Jenny. I am also a nurse educator at Baptist Health Harden. I have been there 18, almost 19 years. We got the pleasure of observing the nursing assistant program here at EC3, and I was very impressed with the skills that they had learned that I did not learn until I was in nursing school. We also uh, were able to attend their capstone fair that they had, and at that fair, the EC3 students had uh, three different topics that they were discussing today, phlebotomy, EKG, as well as pharmacy. Each of them had a poster that they had worked on together, 
and uh, we were able to go around and they could just tell us a little bit about their poster, uh, what they liked about that topic, and we were able to ask questions. We were both very impressed with the students and the way they answered the questions. Uh, they had put a lot of hard work into those projects. Very creative and beautiful posters. Hi, I'm Reagan. I'm here with Haley, Aubrey, Aubrey and, and Reagan. Reagan. Uh, please tell us about your phlebotomy tech. So um, this is a phlebotomy. There's a few things that you need to know. Um, these are the veins that you would draw from normally. And the um, order of draw, which is a very important part of phlebotomy, of course, they're in order. Okay, so the order of draw helps us determine which tests need to be sent to the lab first. So obviously the ones in the front would like have priority versus the ones in the back. Um, our arm here is made out of PVC pipe and clay, so I think that's cool. Um, and then up here we have pictures. So this was um, like the history of phlebotomy, so bloodletting back in like 1000 BC, um, Egyptians would like cut your arm and like let you bleed into bowls and stuff, but it caused like a lot more harm than it did good. Um, and then over here we have the order of draw again. So like, and there's also a memory jogger for it. So like stop light, red, stay put, green light, go. And that has to do with like the tubes and the colors. Um, here, we just have the veins again, just in case you need a better visual than what we have on the arm. And then this is a picture of um, modern phlebotomy. Does somebody want to tell about modern phlebotomy now? Um, that's pretty much what you would see if you like walked into a phlebotomist office and they were drawing somebody's blood. Um, but they, there's three different methods that you could use for venipuncture. There's um, the vacutainer method, which is like the normal method that you would use to like for like adults and just like normal sturdy veins. Then there's the butterfly method, which is just a smaller needle that you would use for geriatric and pediatric patients or people with just fragile or small veins. And then there's also the syringe method, which is a 21 to 23 gauge needle, so it could be pretty much any size. Um, and it's for like people who can't, whose veins can't take the vacutainer, like the vacuum of the vacutainer. So we like pull it up like very slowly to make sure that they don't like collapse and like bust and stuff like that. For like infants and newborns, you stick the heel and get blood out of their heel just because it's safer and easier for them. This is Mackenzie, by the way. Sorry, A lot of us have two different going projects going on, so we're back and forth. <laughs> Um, I just thought you mentioned that one. Yeah, that's about the rundown of like the important stuff that you need to know for phlebotomy. We have the infection control, which is pretty much the same as any healthcare um, environment. Do the basics, and then we have the complications, which could happen to anyone. That's pretty much it. Very nice. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So, can you guys tell me your names? Uh, Lillian Sanders. Uh, <laughs> Reagan Wells. So, what can you tell me about pharmacies? Uh, so, there's a lot that goes into pharmacy, like a whole bunch. There's a bunch of different laws. Um, we progress a lot from the history into modern phlebo uh, pharmacy. Um, and there's a lot of people who accidentally came up with medicines that have saved millions of people. Um, that's like the big stuff. So, who are some people who kind of influenced today's pharmacy and pharmaceutical ways? Um, Benjamin Franklin, he came up with the idea to start like the first hospital pharmacy, so that helped a lot of people inside the hospital. And then after that, we kind of branched out to more options. So we have like closed doors, nuclears, community, all that kind of good stuff. So from the hospital, we branched out to having Walgreens and pharmacies inside of conventional stores. So what is nuclear pharmacy? Uh, nuclear pharmacy is medicine that deals with a bunch of radiation. So you have to have special training, you have to make sure you're extra cautious because radiation can be very harmful to your patient. Mm -hmm. So do pharmacies have laws that they have to abide by? Um, yes, the biggest law almost any healthcare has to uh, abide by is the HIPAA law. So you have to make sure that all your patients is confidential, nothing is talked about unless it, they sign a consent form. 
Um, and then there's a lot of uh, laws to prevent like selling narcotics without prescriptions, a lot of, you know, harmful, painful drugs. So how has just the pharmacy and like just changed over time? Um, so the pharmacy started out with people just mixing together whatever herbs they thought would work. And then it turned into them knowing and having all of them. Uh, it used to be that like anybody could be a pharmacist. Anybody could do whatever they wanted. Now you have to have training and you have to um, follow laws when they used to not have to. Um, you could just mix anything together and give it to somebody and be like, here's your medicine. So they changed a lot in that way. So what do pharmacists do? Um, a lot of pharmacists, they're normally, well, the pharmacy technicians will count the pills, grab it off the shelves, make sure it's the right one, uh, calculate the dose, and then the pharmacist will go behind you and check. Um, and then a lot of the time the pharmacist will reconstitute and like add up the liquid med uh, medicine and stuff and get that all together and they'll uh, we package and label them all the time there's there's a lot that you have to do to make sure that the patient doesn't get the wrong medication mm -hmm. so what does it take to become a pharmacist um, just mm, I don't you have to make sure that you, it's better to start off as a pharmacy technician and then work your way up to becoming a pharmacist, um, but you have to have your master's. I think you have to have your master's to become a pharmacist. So it's a lot of, it's six years or more of school. So what is the Narcotics Act? Uh, the Narcotics Act is put in place to prevent the sale of opium because, they, like I said, they used to just give out medicine to anybody who asked, and then it became addictive, and, you know, yeah, there's a lot of addictive drugs, so they have to put bans on those. Um, like, there's a ban on, like, the sale of Coke in a pharmacy. Even though we don't sell it, we have to have that in place because you never know. So it just prevents the sale of opium. So what is o opium? Just a drug? Just a drug, yeah. Okay. Just like something that helps you. Yeah. Um, marijuana. So. It's addictive. And some of the properties of it can, like, like, I think it was like a drug where um, people got addicted to it and people had new, new changes like, in the mood and actions. And that just kind of like went a little from there. And people saw that. And they started to know it then because it, it was effective on the food and the people. So, accreditation, certification? Uh, that's kind of just like what we're doing. Um, accreditation is when a pharmacy is like allowed to go through with being a pharmacy and they have like all their laws are following them, they get checkups, all that good stuff. Um, and then certification is what we have to get to become a technician um, just to make sure that we know what we're doing, we have all of our study tools, we have everything that we need to know for to do a good job and not make as many mistakes. Well, thank you guys. Thank you. You guys did an amazing job. Will you all introduce yourselves? Uh, Jackson Abel. Navea Pointer. Haley Bogan. Kylie McCoy. Okay. Can you tell me a little bit about your project? Sure. So, um, do I take it? Sure. Okay. Um, EKG. Um, about my project. What do you, What exactly do you want to know from it? Like you like. Um. Tell me about your model. Our model. So our model here. Um. It represents a heartbeat of the EKG. Um, you put the electrodes on someone, and you'll get these movements. On a strip like this, this one has no movement on it. They're a sicily. That's what that's called. They're flatlined. But if they were alive and they had electro pulses, it would look like this, and that's how you want it to look. That's, that's a perfect wave. Everything is timed um, perfectly, and it's, that's how it should look. That's why we did the model. We wanted to showcase it and show people how it looks. Um, but, yeah. Here in the van. Talk about it. Okay, um, so in order to have a normal um, rhythm, you're, you should also be able to identify your P wave. Um, your P wave is where the heart is contracting and it represents depolarization. Um, so as long as you're able to identify your P wave, you're on a great start.
Uh, now I'll go ahead and pass it. Oh, okay. Ellie, I want you to demonstrate. Demonstrate. Okay, so this is how the. E oh my gosh. So. <laughs> This is how the EKG um, electrodes go on. So it goes, um, why, why don't I remember? Right oh yeah, <laughs> right arm, left arm, right leg, left leg. This patient does not have arms or legs, therefore we have to put them on the body. And then you have V1, V2, V3 fell, or no, V2 fell, sorry. And then there's V3, V4, V5, and V6. Um, they all go in different places, so they all have different views of the heart. Um, so like V, Three is like mid-clavicular line, fourth intercostal space, Just that just means in between the ribs. And then like V5, um, <laughs> V no, is this V4? Yes, it's V4. Oh, V4. Yes. And then it just keeps going in a line essentially. Um, so this, your patient has to stay still, no talking, no moving. It's best if you remove cell phones because that can cause like um, a mess up with the EKG. So like once all that is done, you have to make sure your patient doesn't have any chest hair. If they do, you need to trim it. You need to make sure you clean off the area with alcohol pads. And then it'll start, oh my gosh, I forgot it's touch screen. Um, it starts showing up on this machine. And usually there will be move on here because usually your patient is alive. Um, and then once it like, <laughs> and then once it settles out, you just hit print. Why is it not working? It's making me look stupid. Thank you. And then it'll print itself. I know. And you're supposed to like enter like the date and everything and tell whether it's male or female because if you get that wrong, it can mess up the EKG strip. And then it'll print out just like this, except for they'll be alive. Thank you.